There you good. All right. I used to, I, I like saying finest frog hair. Y'all ever heard that one before? Okay, that's the one I usually like to say. It messes people up. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord again this morning. As you can see, Brother Ronnie and Sister Deb are not here today, so kind of just changing the way things normally are. So uh, remember the service today. But before we start, um, just want to kind of go over some announcements. I do believe right now Children's Church, uh, Sister Judy, will be uh, yes or no? No, okay. All right, just checking. So, all right, that was different. So, Children's Church will not be today. That is fine. Uh, we do have some prayer requests that we'll be bringing to Lord. So, remember, uh, according to this, remember our lost family um, members, our lost loved ones. If you notice, that is the top of our list in the announcements. It should be always the top of our prayers. Remember the lost loved ones. Remember our church. Remember the nation and our president, whoever that might be this coming year. Uh, remember Israel, remember Sister Frances Bass, uh, Sister Dolores Mayo, Brother Carl Belch, as well as K Sister Carolyn Brown. Remember Brother Angela, uh, excuse me, Brother Albert and Sister Angela, and Otis and Linda Clark. Also, please remember Sister Mary Squibbs, uh, my wife and children. We went to go see her uh, earlier this week. She's doing okay. She misses her family. She misses her church. She misses being here. Um, keep her in prayer. And um, also, remember, she asked us to remember her children. She loves them, and she wants to see them saved. So remember them in your prayers today. So uh, we're going to go to the Lord uh, in prayer this morning before we begin. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of prayer, dear God. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for everything you've done for us. It is good to be in the house of the Lord again this morning. Now, Lord, I ask you now to bless this immediate service. Bless each and every one who are in here and the ones who are watching at Facebook, oh God. Let them feel your presence in a mighty way. And Lord, let us have a good day. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So we are going to do a practice run today on singing. Sister Joy is going to try the best to play some piano. I, I'm going to try the, my best to sing. And if we are off key, it is okay. All right. <laughs> off key, okay, same thing, right? Off key and okay. All right. So we will do our best. Uh, <laughs> Joy asked me, he's like, what key do you sing in? I think I don't know. <laughs> uh, I like what Brother Oren used to say. I sing also. Um, not So we're going to do our best. If you would turn into, I believe you might be putting, are you putting it up on the front? So we're going to be singing, leaning on the, his everlasting arms. Okay, We're going to try G, and uh, I will probably not match. What's the best one you think I need to be in, love? I don't know. We'll make it up. We're going to try. All right. Go ahead, Joy. I'll see if I can do it.
wasn't too bad. <laughs> that wasn't too bad at all. Well, it is time to do our tithe and offerings this morning. Sister Joy is going to play something for us. If you have something that you want to put up front, please do so at this time. Before we begin, we're going to sing here just a moment. I do want to go to the Lord again in prayer. Uh, uh, were there any unspoken requests this morning by the uplifting of the hand? Do any of you have any outspoken requests? So Leanne Landing still needs prayer for her hip. Uh, we saw her not too terribly long ago. She, you can tell she's still in a lot of pain. But uh, remember her in prayer. Robin Buck. Okay. Uh, all right. So remember the family of Robin Buck. Uh, she passed away. Uh, any others? Brother Orman Mayo is asking prayer for his cousin. We know the situation there. Continue to pray for that family. Brother Orrin, if you can start walking your way up to the front, I'd appreciate it. Remember the immediate service this morning. Remember the preacher of the hour. God give him the word. Remember Brother Ronnie and Sister Deb. I know they went to, I think they went to the mountains. I, you know what? I might be wrong on that, but um, they're in the mountains. I would be surprised otherwise. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Brother Orrin. Lord, we're so thankful for the privilege that we have to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Thank you, Lord, for the provisions you've made for our healing. We know, Lord, that we have our salvation that comes only through and by you to others that say that they're God, that they didn't die for our sin, and they all have graves. But we, Lord, we thank you that your grave is empty and that we have a hope that's uh, eternal in the heavens. Bless each request that was given in today, Lord. You know each one individually. You know each need. We ask, Lord, that you would undertake in behalf of each one. We know, Lord, when you were here on earth that you healed everyone that came to you. And so we know, Lord, it's your... Uh, privilege to heal us and help us, Lord, to have the faith that we need to receive from you uh, everything that you have available. Draw us closer to you, Lord. Be ready redeem, to redeem the time, Lord, because we know the days are evil. Uh, bless Brother Gentry as he stands today in the sacred pit, our full pit, uh, to del deliver the message that comes from you. Have us all, all to have open ears and open hearts and open minds to receive the word. Draw us all closer to you, Lord. Give us a uh, revival in these last days. If we can't have one collectively, let us have one individually, Lord, because we, our hope is in you. Uh, thank you today, Lord, for all your blessings upon us. And we, uh, we know, Lord, that you, you loved us. You gave yourself for us even before the foundation of the world. Help us, Lord, to give our life to you. And here a welcome, well done, and end this life. And these blessings and favors we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. <clears throat>
guess y'all are hearing me a lot today. We're going to get my family to come on up. We're going to sing a song with you uh, for you today. camp meeting song so if you know it please join in and sing with us and uh, remember it's in your prayer this morning I don't know why I just took my glasses off because I can't see it I'm ha I'm not used to glasses yet <clears throat> all right till the world Jesus saves us love is love ever seen to the lost weary soul happy tidings now bring let us fall I guess I better turn myself on. First half of my ministry, we didn't know what these things were. Okay. It's good to be here today. I know a lot of folks take vacation this time of the year. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> but we all need a vacation need to be 
And even Jesus took time to get away alone. For a few moments this morning, I came across uh, a statement I heard some time ago that's really stuck with me. And this statement said it very like, much like this. He said, do not settle for less than the best. So I would ask you the question this morning, while we're sharing some thoughts will you, ask yourself, are you settling for less than the best? And for scripture reading, I would like to read from the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. I'm going to read a part of three of the, the churches that John wrote about. The first one's in Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. This is what he says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless... I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, John put it this way. He says, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know the hour I will come. And then in Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14, John says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou saith, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. I would ask you again to think with me for a moment. Can you... Think of some experience in your life where you settled for less than the best. You could have done better. You could have come out better, but you settled for less than the best. I imagine if we're all honest with ourselves, we've all done that at times. You know, there's a number of places in the Bible where this same truth comes out. I thought about Adam and Eve there in the garden when they were tempted by Satan. There we found that when they were tempted, they settled for fruit when they could have had fellowship with God. And then I thought about Lot, Abraham's nephew. You remember because God had blessed Abraham and Lot so much that they had to separate. And Abraham gave Lot the choice. He says, whichever way you go, I'll go the opposite. Lot chose the fertile plains of, of Sodom. And we know it got him in trouble. So as we look at Lot's experience there, we realize that he settled for the land when he could have had God's love. I thought about Esau and Jacob. You remember uh, Jacob's name means trickster. He was always trying to figure out a way to get something. And one day his brother Esau came in. He'd been hunting all day and he was hungry and tired. And uh, Jacob had a pot of beans on, and uh, 
And you can imagine if you come in hungry, smelling something like that, how hungry you get. And we're told because of his weakness, Esau settled for a a bowl of lentils when he could have had the birthright. I thought about another experience in the Bible when the children of Israel getting ready to go into the land of Israel. The first thing they had to do was conquer Jericho. And God says, I'm going to take care of it for you. Don't take any spoils, everything there I want. Well, they went in and you know the story. The, The walls fell and they were victorious. But when they tried to go to the next little place called Ai, they lost the battle. Joshua, he was really upset. He fell on his face before God and said, Lord, what happened? God says, there's sin in the camp. And come to find out a man by the name of Achan had stolen some stuff. And so the point there is that he settled for a little when he could have had the load. I thought about before they got into Israel crossing the Jordan, we're told that uh, two and a half tribes looked around and saw how fertile the land was. It was good for their cattle and sheep and things. So they said, let us just stay here. Let this be our inheritance. And so Moses finally settled to let them do that. And we, we see there in the long run, these two and a half tribes of Israel settled for comfort when they could have had conquest. Then I thought about one that we're all familiar with, a man by the name of Samson. You remember the story of Samson. We're told that he settled for pleasure when he could have had power. I thought in the New Testament even, there was the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus today and asked, what must I do to have eternal life? And when Jesus explained it all to him, it says he turned and walked away sadly because he was very rich. So that young man, he could he settled for money when he could have had the master. I thought about Judas Iscariot. We all know his story. He settled for a 30 pieces of silver when he could have had the Savior. I thought about Ananias and Sapphire. You know the story of them in the book of Acts when they sold a piece of land and, brought, and made out like they brought it all in, but they kept part of it back. And as a result, they both lost their life. So Ananias and Sapphire, they settled for riches when they could have had relationship. And so you could read on and on in the Bible and in our experiences today, oftentimes we settle for less than the best in our life. Now I want to look at these three churches that we read here in Revelation. Here in Ephesians, in Revelation, Ephesus church chapter 2, God says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them that are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And then in verse 4 he says, because thou hast left thy first love. This, these people in the Ephesus church settle for activity rather than abiding with the Lord. You see, they, like many folks, they made the mistake that even Martha and Mary made there in the New Testament. You remember, I think it's in Luke chapter 10, about the 38th verse, that Luke says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But then it says, But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to Jesus and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore to come and help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And that Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So what is the moral of that story there? Labor is never a substitute for worship. Back in the Ephesus church in verse 2, 
there John writing said they they had it all together they were active they were busy in the church but he said the thing against them is they had left their first love they just didn't lose it somewhere they willfully left it left it because of their activity. You ever thought about how many times we get so busy doing things for the Lord in the church that we forget the more important things? All through the scripture when you read, read about the Lord, the thing that he desires of his people the most is that we abide with him, that we worship him, that we spend time with him. All these other things are important that we do but there's one thing that's more needful. He wants us to abide with him. It's so true today because we get so active, we forget to abide. You know, there's a lot going on in our lives and in the church today. Uh, it's been a few years since I've been pastoring, since I retired, but I'm sure it hasn't changed. It might be even worse now than it was back then. You can, you can just work yourself to death, so to speak, trying to do things in the church when what God wants us to do is to abide with him. Our activities, the things we do, really, if you think about it, it should be those things that bring us to the feet of Jesus to abide in his presence and to learn from him, to grow in him, and to gain strength in him. Is that what we do in our church today? Are we trying to learn to abide in him? to learn from him, to grow in him. I read somewhere where one fellow put about the church this way. He said, sometimes the church becomes nothing more than a social club. And that may be true in some instances. I don't know. But this brings a question to my mind this morning that I pass on to you. When was the last time that you and I came to church for the sole purpose of abiding in his presence? That's hard to do because... You know, we come together for, for fellowship and we need that. But our main purpose in coming together should be to abide in his presence. Uh, I wonder sometimes if that's not why there's so much burnout in voluntary work in the church. Some people d do so much they just get burned out. Because I know when I was pastoring churches, one of the things I looked for if I needed help is to find somebody that was doing something. If you found somebody wasn't doing anything, they weren't going to do it anyway. Uh, it's those people that are busy, but you can become so busy doing activities in the church, which are good things, but you miss the most important thing of all, and that's abiding in his presence. God, I believe, is more concerned with what we do with him than what we do for him. We may desire to you know, bring the Lord a perfect work, and I think that's what we all want to do. But God would like to point out, I believe, that when our work is done to a beautiful, ripened grain, and the sheaves are bound up, and yet, when you think about it, the Lord will oftentimes frustrate our plans. Uh, he shatters our purposes, and he lets us see the wreck of all of our hopes. And he breaks the beautiful structure we thought we were building. And what he wants to do is to catch us up into his arms. He says, it's not your works I want, it's you. He wants us. He wants us. The work that keeps us from the quiet hour is that which draws its strength from the quiet hour. I learned when I was at Holmes Bible College, we had... In the morning, the first hour when the bell rang at 6, they called it quiet hour. You didn't talk. You got ready and you spent that hour reading your Bible and, and seeking the Lord. I got in the habit of that 60-some years ago, and this to this day, I still do that. And if something happens to mess up my schedule in the morning, it throws my whole day off. Because I've come to learn in my life God wants me to abide with him in his presence. And you know what? When I do that, I come out, I have a better day. Things go better for me uh, in that day. Because we are strongest when we are abiding, so we must abide in his presence. Now that next church, Sardis in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, 
These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, and that thou livest and art dead. Now, what happened to that church in Sardis? When you think about it, they actually, they traded in the anointing for acceptance in society. I, I've been around long enough, and I'm looking at some of you, you've probably been around as long as I have, uh, how it used to be in the church. I can remember in the early days of the church, uh, Pentecostal or holiness people were sort of looked down on in the communities. They were the churches on the other side of the track, if you, if, as you say. Uh, but we've, as old Solomon put it, we've come a long ways, baby, in these days. God has really blessed and things are better. Um, but this people at Sardis, the scripture says they were so accepted that they could no longer effectively minister for God. And how true that is oftentimes. You see, what happens a lot of times, the offense of the cross is gone. We know, you know, it's hard to get people in church today and get witness to them. If you ever, ever do any witnessing much, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, people need to know that God loves them. Uh, no longer were people in, in the church at Sardis offended by their gospel. They had to make a change, and now they were accepted. Is that what we want in society today, to be accepted? On one hand, we say, well, that's true. But you see, it's one thing to have a reputation but no lifestyle. We need to be able to back up what we say we believe when we're out in society. If we say we believe something, then people are going to look at you to see if that's what you really believe. How important it is. They had a reputation but no lifestyle. Now, even the Apostle Paul spoke about this in writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 5, he said they were people who had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. And he said those kind of people turn away from them. You see, Paul knew exactly what he was talking about because he too had experienced that in his life in his earlier days when his name was still Saul before they changed his name. Because in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul put it this way. He says, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. He said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And if you read the early life of Saul there in the book of Acts, that's exactly what he did. He was going around People who claimed uh, Jesus Christ, he'd have them arrested and put in jail and, and, and see many times that they were put to death. He was so zealous he, in what he believed. But the thing, see, during that time, Paul was really accepted by the Jewish people of that day. He was one of their leading scholars, and, and, but he had no anointing. Until that day he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. It turned his life around. He was no longer the same. The one thing, you know, it's one thing to be accepted, but I believe it's something else to be anointed by God. That, that's always my prayer. God, I just want to be anointed by you on a daily basis. And, and it's easy to fall into that trap because many times we're concerned about what other people think about us. I, I've seen this even in church work through the years. I can remember one church that I pastored. I was trying to get people out in the community into church and I was talking about this one family that I had invited to church and one of the dear ladies of the church came to me and pulled me aside and said, Brother Gentry, uh, we don't want those kind of people in our church. I said, why? They have a soul. They need Jesus. What she was really saying is, well, let them go somewhere else. And I've never forgotten that. It makes a difference. People want to be accepted in society. The church needs, if you want the church to really be accepted in the society, you let the power of God be in the, the, those services, and it will draw people. I can remember growing up, uh, people used to flock out to a full gospel church revival services because something was going on. One of the things that I, I often think about when I guess I was about 12 years of age, in the community, some church put up a tent, and they had revivals, and people just flocked out. 
And there were many people sitting on the outside of the tent. They were what I call spectators. They just wanted to see what was going on. But sometimes, you know, the power of God would come outside of that tent and get a hold of them and get a hold of their heart, and they would find themselves down at the altar and sometimes even down in the sawdust until they got their heart right with the Lord. But it's one thing to be accepted, but another to be anointed. Paul warns us about that. He says, beware when all men speak well of you. Now, we all like to have a pat on the back once in a while, but we don't need to let it go to our head. You know, I thought about in the uh, book of Hebrews, I think it is chapter 11. We call that the faith chapter, a lot of men and women of faith. But if you read there, they had a lot of faith, but many of them gave their life for what they believed. It didn't matter what the, the world did or what they thought. Uh, they were there because they read and they lived the life because they had the anointing. We need that anointing in society today. Our churches need to really be the way. And I think the only way we will affect this world is to be bold with our message about the risen Savior. That's the only way. Now, one more church I read to you about was in Laodicea, uh, and that is chapter 3, verses 14. In that he says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them which with the sword of my mouth. Now, why was God saying that? These people in the Laodicean church, they had settled for a fluency rather than the actuality of God's Spirit in their life. God is really wanting us to be on fire for Him. You say, well, what is that affluence anyway? Well, if I understand it correctly, it means the abundance of material things, possessions, having for the sake of having. I can remember in years ago, I, I, I say I'm old, I guess I'm old according to some people, but I can remember used to for the church to do a lot of things they wanted to do. We had to have bake sales, hot dog sales. And I can remember in the early days we even bought candy and sold it. Maybe some of you remember those days. But we were trying to raise money to do some of the things. But through the years, God has blessed the church, has blessed people. And we have much more than we used to have. And we need to learn that, you know, even though we may be self-sufficient today, because of that, many people don't feel the need of God in their life. You think about it, when a person gets between a rock and a hard spot, what do they usually do? They call on the church or some Christian they know to pray for them. Oh, we're in trouble. Will you pray? And that's good. We, they ought to do that, and we need to pray for them. But the tragedy is they shouldn't wait until they get between a rock and a hard spot to call upon God. It should be something that we do in our life daily. But the Laodicean church had become so self-sufficient, they just didn't feel the need of God anymore. They felt like they had it all. But, you know, I believe God wants his children to, I, want, I believe God wants us to have the very best. But more importantly, I believe he wants us to have his spirit. I believe that's what's important. We can get so caught up today for, in having for the sake of having that we forget about God's spirit. That's so important. I, I've thought about this a lot and I've tried it. You know, if you, your pastor announced we're just going to come out and have a time of prayer, you, you can't get many people to come out just to pray. Something has to be going on to draw them. And oftentimes when they come out to pray, they sit and do more talking than they do praying. But prayer changes things. Uh, it's important that we understand that, you know, we get so caught up in having for the sake of having that we forget about God's spirit. I read this story one time that I think fits this very good. And it, it's a story about a young man who was well off. In fact, it says he drove a BMW car. If you know anything about cars, you've got to have a little money to drive one of those. And he had all the uh, uh, whistles on it. And uh, he had his cell phone. I mean, he, he was living it up. And one day he was riding down the road. He had the radio music playing on his radio, enjoying life, talking on his cell phone. 
And for some reason, he decided he wanted to change the station on his radio, and he, he reached over. And you know how easy it is. You can take your attention off of the road, and it'll take but just a second. And he wound up in the ditch, going at a high rate of speed. There happened to be a younger man in a little pickup truck behind him, and he saw what happened, so he pulled over to check and see how the man was. So he, when he walked up to the car in the ditch, reckon he, he heard the man uh, send the oil. He said he was just feeling so. He says, look, at my new BMW is ruined. And the young man looked at him in surprise and says, you're worried about your car? Haven't you looked? Your arm is missing. And he looked over and he says, where's my Rolex watch? The point there is, sometimes we get so caught up in the uh, ointments on the limb, we forget about the actuality of the limb. What is important in our life? What difference does it make if we have works and emotional experiences or a lot of money if we don't have God's spirit is the point. Amen. There's nothing more important than having the presence and spirit of God with us at all times. I believe that a lot of people today are in bondage because they've been caught up in the world's affairs of what the world has to offer. They don't have a need. I can think of several experiences while I was pastoring of people that God blessed in business. They used to be really on fire for God, but it got to where you couldn't even see them in church. They were too busy doing other things. God had prospered them so much. You see, what we do a lot of times is we offer up on the altar of the temporary and we settle for less than the best. How important it is that we understand what we need to do. There is such a need in the local body today in saying, can I feel that need? Can I become that servant that Christ was? But many times what people say, and, and I've experienced this, and maybe you have too, when you want people to do something in church, Sometimes they don't say it, but you can see it on their face. What's in it for me? I've even had people quit doing things that nobody ever appreciates what I do. You don't do it for people's appreciation. You're doing it for the glory of God. But we have trouble understanding that sometimes. You know, people like, we all like a pat on the back once in a while. But we don't let, need to let that bother. And, you know, money is important. But if we trust God and seek his kingdom, what does Jesus say there in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6? He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto ye. We need to get things in perspective. He said also there, you cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to make up your mind which way to go. So that's why I say, are we settling for less than the best in our life? God should be first. Let me wind up this thought this morning with one more scripture. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Three things there that Jesus says to us. First of all, he says we must realize and remember. Many of us oftentimes don't realize that we have settled for less than the best. We think we're doing right. I uh, re was reading in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 6, the sons of the prophets, their, their school had grown to the point they felt like they needed to enlarge. So one day one of the students came to the prophet Elisha and says, we're going to go down here next to the river and build us a bigger place. Will you go with us? He said, I'll go with you. So they were down there, and, and you could almost see the story. They were cutting down the trees. And all of a sudden, one of the students cried out uh, to Elisha, and he says, Oh, my Lord, it was barred. What had happened, the head of the axe that he was using had come off and fell in the water. And he says, And I barred that axe. It's not mine. And you remember the story how uh, prophet Elisha says, Well, where did it fall? And, and he put the stick out and, re and recovered it. Uh, I thought about that. You know, if, if he hadn't realized the head of that axe had fallen out, he'd just been swinging that handle. No, nothing happening in his life. Uh, sometimes that's what happens in our life. The head comes off of our life, and we don't realize that the cutting edge is gone. 
Samson, I, I thought about him, he didn't realize uh, that his edge was gone until his hair was cut off. And he wound up in the prison. He remembered what it was like then to have God's best. And the second thing about that scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Jesus says we not only must realize and remember, but we must repent and return. Our text over and over in Revelation, Jesus says repent, return, repent, return. We must determine to find God's best for our life and get it back. Samson did that when he was in prison, said his hair began to grow and his strength came back. And you know the story how he had that young man that was looking after him, put him in between those two pillows and he pushed them down. And the scripture says he defeated more Philistines in his death than he did in his whole life once he got his priorities right. The sons of the prophet, when he cried out to Elisha and he took him to the place where he lost his axe, then he got it back. And the third thing, not only must we remember, realize and remember, repent and return, but third, we must resolve that we will never settle for less than the best. I'm sure the son of the prophet was smart enough to check the head of that axe after that and make sure it didn't come off. We must be sure it's there and always sharp and ready to use Christ, I think, wrapped it up the best when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember when he was in the Garden of Agony, he tried to get his disciples to stay with him, be alert, especially those close to him, but uh, he stepped over a little ways from them. And, and, and the Bible says, and in great agony, Jesus called out to his heavenly Father, if there be any other way, but nevertheless, he says, not my will, but thine be done. And I've often thought about that. Never to, nevertheless, to be effective in this local body of God, we must have God's best. You see, activities will not suffice for abiding in His presence. Acceptance will not suffice for the anointing of God. Affluency will never suffice for the actuality of God's Spirit in our life. So I would ask you again this morning, are we settling for less than the best in our life? God wants us to have His very best, and that best is abiding in His presence. Folks, the older I get, the more I realize Jesus is certainly coming soon. To be honest with you, I never really thought Jesus would wait this long before He came back. I can think of many years in passion when we come to the end of the year, I'd always say to the church I was pastoring, you know, I'm disappointed. I really thought Jesus was coming this year. He hasn't come yet, but we're that much closer to his coming. Let's not be willing to settle for less than the best. He wants the best for us, that we abide in his presence. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your patience with me. I thank you, Lord, for those times that I have settled for less than the best, that you've been right there to try to jog my memory, to prod me along to help me to see that abiding in your presence is the most important thing of all. I pray your blessings on this church. Be with the pastor and his wife as they away for a little R&R. &R. When they come back, may they be refreshed, and may this church really come alive not willing to settle any longer for less than the best in their life. If there's any doing that, Lord, may we make up our mind we're not going to do it anymore because I believe you're coming soon. And, Lord, we need to be ready to meet you for we don't know when it's going to be. May you bless this congregation, bless this community, Lord, for we ask it all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let us stand. <clears throat> Unless you have something to say, just consider you dismissed.